For those of you who are joining, go ahead and take a look at this screen. We're going to do a Mentimeter poll to begin with. So you can log into menti.com and Tanya will show you the code in a couple seconds. All right, everybody, welcome. Tanya's getting this Mentimeter poll going. As you've joined, I've been um, muting you. So Tanya, if you just click present right up there in the top right. There you go. Yep. So if you go to Menti, I'm going to do some logistical stuff. If you go to menti.com and use that code 2052920, you can do it on your cell phone or on another window on your computer. Um, we'll just have a little quiz for you as we get going here. Um, I'm Hannah Tester. I'm from NeighborWorks, Montana. I'll be your room host as well as facilitator for this breakout session. Uh, we're so excited that you've joined us today. Um, please do mute your lines as you jump on. I've been muting, uh, admitting everybody from the waiting room. So yep, go ahead and mute as you join, connect to audio right now. And if you just joined us, uh, while I'm doing some logistical housekeeping stuff, you can um, go to menti.com and use that code and take a little survey. We'll go through it in just a minute. Again, I'm Hannah Tester from NeighborWorks Montana, room host and facilitator for this breakout session. Um, we're so excited that you've joined us today. Uh, please, like I said, do mute your lines. I've been trying to mute people as they join. Um, if you have questions as we are, as the presenters are presenting today, you can go ahead and put those questions in the chat. We will do our best to address all questions before the end of the session. Um, just a reminder, all the, all sessions are being recorded. Um, please mute your lines and turn off your video while the presenters are presenting. That'll just help us with, with any instability in the connection. Um, go ahead and uh, when you're done doing this Mentimeter survey, um, 
click the chat icon, select all panelists and attendees, and enter your name, organization, and uh, where you are, your location. Uh, you may turn your videos back on during the Q&A time at the end of our session. Um, one more thing, each of you should have received a whiteboard and a paddle, which is blending into my background right now. Um, it, it, you should have received these in the mail. If you find something inspiring, exciting, or new, go ahead and write a quick adjective on that whiteboard um, and hold it up. Let us know during the Q&A session. And with that, we'll get going. I know all of you are trying to answer these Mentimeter questions, but I'll start um, going through the answers. Some of them have right or wrong answers. Some of them are just um, opinions. So this first one, how many federally recognized tribes are in Montana? Uh, the correct answer is, Tanya, you can hit enter and it'll show us eight. So good job, most of you are right. Um, the next question was just kind of, uh, we wanted to get some, some words and some inspiration from you all. Um, so it's, what does home mean to you? You can hit enter to go to that next slide. Is it moving forward? Oh. Enter to show correct, and then it should be enter to the next slide too. Well, this is our last one, but that's okay. What is the main thing that makes home ownership harder in Montana tribal communities? Trust land. Inventory, that's a hard one everywhere right now. Culture, interesting. We'll talk about a lot of these today. Let's see what question we get next, Tanya. <laughs> Is enter still doing nothing? Okay. So I can just talk through these too. What was the name um, of the, although I will want to see that word bubble with the what home means to you, that'll be fun to see. Um, but what was the name of the 1887 act that allowed federal government to break up tribal lands into small individual allotments for farming and ranching and sell any surplus lands to non-native settlers? The answer to that one is the Dawes Act. Yep. I see people putting it in the chat. There you go. Um, and then this, this last one, uh, super interesting. When did Native Americans become US citizens? Um, the year was 1924. So not until 1924 did President Calvin Coolidge sign into law the Indian Citizenship Act. So pretty, pretty interesting history there. Um, before we dive into our panel, uh, I wanted to start by acknowledging that I am coming to you from Missoula, Montana, which is the traditional land of the Salish and Kootenai people. I want to thank them for their stewardship of this land for generations. We are so looking forward to hearing today from an incredible panel of experts who are going to talk through barriers, challenges, and opportunities when it comes to home ownership for our Native neighbors. To lay this, the groundwork for this panel discussion, I would like to introduce Tanya Plummer. Tanya is an enrolled tribal member and is the executive director for the Montana Native Growth Fund, a Native Community Development Financial Institution or CDFI on the Fort Belknap Reservation. Her work experience is in mortgage banking and she is an active and vocal advocate for tribal home ownership, which she believes is a cornerstone of stimulate, uh, stimulating and stabilizing tribal economies and securing sovereign futures. Tanya? 
Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the introduction. And I would like to welcome everyone um, here today. I'm so grateful to have such a robust group of individuals. Um, I'm so grateful for you to share this space um, with us to explore what Native homeownership in Montana and Indian country means. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, setting up the conversation and providing some context. Um, I'd like to give us a little bit of a history lesson, um, but I'd also like to make that history lesson very personal um, and relate it specifically to, to my family. Um, so what you're seeing before you is this is actually um, signatures that are on the Fort Laramie Treaty that established some of our reservations here in Montana, um, including the Fort Belknap Indian community. Um, from 1828 to 1827, we found ourselves in the removal reservation and treaty period. During this time, that's when reservations were established and treaties were established that required tribal nations to trade large tracts of our land for continued right to self-governance. And that concept itself of now no longer being able to roam free um, and follow our traditional economies um, was very controversial. Um, I think it really shook things up for our tribal nations at that time. Um, and it created this, this immense culture shift. Uh, and this was the, the early beginnings of that. Uh, you can see my neighbors, Assiniboine and the Grovant leadership and their signatures here. Um, ultimately that created in Montana, eight tribal nations. Um, we have um, the Rocky Boy, Chippewa Cree, the Blackfeet Nation up in Browning, uh, the Crow Tribe in the southeastern corner of the state, um, Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes on the Flathead Reservation on the western end of the state, our Fort Peck Tribes, Assiniboine Sioux up in the north East Corner, um, our Cheyenne River Tribe, Fort Belknap Indian Community in the central portion of the state, and then our newly federally recognized Little Shell Chippewa Tribe, which remain landless, um, but they are very much uh, getting their systems in place and being assertive about meeting the needs of their people. Um, this is where our eight tribal um, nations are located throughout the states. For some of you, this is not new at all, but for some of you that it might be very new. I wanted to break things down just a little bit more. Uh, this photo here is a picture of some of our leadership at Fort Belknap. This individual in the bottom right hand corner is my grandpa, um, William Bigby. He was one of the original signers of the Fort Belknap Indian, Con Indian Constitution. Um, just to give you a little bit more context, 1828 to 1887 was removal of reservation and treaties. From 1887 to 1934 was an allotment and assimilation period. It was where the government decided they weren't quite sure reservations were working right. And so instead, let's give Indians a small allotment of land and teach them to be farmers or ranchers <laughs> and assimilate them into Western society, removing their cultural heritage. In 18, excuse me, 1980, my great grandfather was born. Excuse me, I have that wrong. It's actually 1880. He was born in the midst of that first wave of change. So that means when my grandpa right here was seven years old, the Dawes Act was passed and that dictated the forced conver conversion of communally held tribal lands into small parcels. Um, it sold off any surplus lands to non-Indian citizens. And at that time, over 90 million acres were taken from tribes and given to settlers, often without conversation. So I just want yourself to look at him and imagine his life as a seven-year-old experiencing what he was experiencing with his parents. So let's dig a little bit deeper. My grandpa, Bill Bigby. This is his United States Census record with his parents. He was born to seven and broken robe. On the census records, I don't know how closely you can see it in here on this right hand side, but it shows them as ration Indians. That means they had just been placed on the reservation with an entirely crashed economy and no means of supporting themselves. And so they were labeled as ration Indians. He was one of few who received an education over here in these columns up here, there's columns for a homeowner and educated. And they would say yes or no. 
to whether or not they had a home or an education. So my grandpa was one of few who received an education, but he was not one of few who ever owned a home. This photo is a picture of some Fort Belknap representatives um, over in South Dakota at a Committee of Indian Affairs. And this gentleman right here in the middle is also my grandpa. So let's step forward a little bit more in time. That was my maternal great grandfather. My paternal grandfather was born in a tent on the side of the Missouri River, just outside Fort Belknap, still in the allotment and the assimilation period in 1919. When he was born, he was not a United States citizen because the Citizenship Act wasn't passed until he was five years old in 1924. My Great grandfather you just saw, Bill Bigby, was not a United States citizen until he was 44 years old. So again, 87 to 90, 1934, allotment and assimilation period. 1934 to 1945 was the Indian reorganization period. Allotment and assimilation didn't work. And so the government said, well, let's just shake this up. Let's reorganize this and figure out how to do it better. And, and that only, you can see that only lasted 11 years. And then they went into the termination period. Federal recognition of Indian tribes ended. They attempted to move Indians from reservations into urban areas. And that was an economic and cultural disaster for tribal nations. It was an ultimate identity crisis. So I have no photos of my paternal grandfather, but this is exactly where he was born. And I want you to just think about his life. In the course of his life, he was a citizen of two nations, he was assimilated, reorganized, attempted to be terminated, and then expected to be self-determined all in one lifetime. This was my grandfather's experience, and that is who raised my dad. So this is my dad. He was born in 1952 in Fort Belknap. Um, they were born to parents who, who were barely United States citizens themselves during a time of upheaval. He was born in the middle of the termination period. The hospital where he was born in Fort Belknap is no longer standing. I don't know if you can see behind here, uh, we took a picture out hunting this last year and this is the home where he was born. It's also, it's barely standing, kind of fallen over. My dad carried the cultural shame and the bitterness of his elders experience for a long, long time. He worked really hard to protect me from that bitterness, uh, but he had no examples of home ownership to follow. He's never had a home mortgage. In his late 50s, he raised enough money to build a home with cash and he charged the rest on credit cards, $36,000 on credit cards, just to build a home on a two and a half acre tribal home site lease. He's never had a mortgage and he just recently at 69 paid off the debt. And that brings us a little bit closer. In 1968 to 2000 was the self-determination period and I was born in the midst of that period. In 1976 in Glasgow, Montana, just four years after the Indian Self-Determination Act of 1972. So that means that my generation is only three generations from surviving extermination, two generations removed from becoming citizens, and one generation away from attempted termination. Our story is repeated over and over again in Indian country. And so the, the takeaway here is that I want you to understand is Indians started at a deficit. And, and it's no wonder why it's so difficult for us to rise above and, and make homeownership happen. This is me and my four children. I became the first homeowner in my family. And I strongly believe that it's up to my generation to make homeownership possible for all Native Americans. So I wanna take that timeline that we just studied in Indian countries timeline and sort of put that alongside timeline of, of mortgage offerings, okay, and what we know about homeownership in general. In 1938, Fannie Mae was founded. My grandpa that was born by the river was 19 years old when that happened. Fannie Mae had been offering loans for 34 years before the Indian Self-Determination Act and 58 years before Nahasda came on the scene. That's a lot of practice before Indians had opportunities. 1965, HUD was founded. My dad was 13 years old and HUD had been offering loans for seven years 
before the Indian Self-Determination Act and 31 years before Nahasda. That's more practice before Indians ever had opportunities. In 1996, Nahasda was established HUD ONAP. This is 20 years after I was born. This is in my lifetime. Nahasda was established. We have a caller on the call who actually reached out to me before this session um, who knew me as a youth director in 1993 before Nahasda was established. And, and that's just incredible to me that so little has happened in this time period. We take it for granted that there's opportunities for Indians and yet this is very, very new. In 2021 today, Less than 10% of HUD 184s are loans are performed on trust lands. USDA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they're barely, if at all, able to perfect loans on trust lands. So again, we started at a deficit, but no less deserving of equity and homeownership opportunities. So that leads us to our, our session title for the day. We called this Scouting for Native Homeownership. And um, I guess I was sort of drawing an analogy that's become personal to me in the last four years since my son graduated high school. I've been teaching my girls with and going with my dad and my brother and learning how to hunt, partly for the experience and partly because it's good for us to know how to provide for ourselves. Uh, we've learned so many lessons from this experience that I've taken away as just life enrichment lessons. Um, and I wanna kind of go over those in the context of our conversation today. Uh, this is my daughter and my brother up here. Um, you can see that there's a deer up in this top corner that we're kind of scoping out. I don't know if you can barely see that little dot up there. Um, but what I wanted to share that's unique about looking at scouting for native homeownership is that the heart of, you know, when we hunt, the heart of hunting is not um, to bag a trophy animal. It's not to tell a big story, it's to provide for our families, okay? That means when we talk home ownership, the conversation doesn't need to be about equity or wealth creation. It is literally about providing for our families over the long run. Um, when we get ready to hunt, we spend a lot of time preparing for that. We spend a lot of time sighting in our guns and shooting and practicing. We spend a lot of time um, studying animals and behaviors and things like that. Um, we make sure we have the right gear. We know the weather. We know the behaviors. When it's snowing, they're going to behave a little bit different. When the wind's blowing a certain way, they're going to behave different. There are times of day where the animals are going to be doing different things. And I guess what I'm wanting us to see is that when we look at scouting for native homeownership at getting ready to provide new and better opportunities for homeownership. There's a lot of preparation and a lot of knowing the landscape that I think we're missing the mark in some of those areas. We're not understanding how to go out and do this well. One thing I've learned is that I hate sitting point <laughs> when you're hunting. I don't know how many of you are hunters, but it doesn't matter how good my gear is. You know, I can have the best gun in the world, the best binoculars in the world, and I can sit point and hope that I'm going to get the animal that I want to bag. Sometimes I think that's how we approach homeownership in Indian country. We can set up a homeowner education class. Come to our class. We're going to tell you all about how to do this. You know, you're basically sitting point and hoping to catch something along the way. And it doesn't always work. Every now and then you might get one. The better plan is always to walk the riverbeds. And so when we're out together, I'll go in the middle, my brother here, my cousin here, my dad over here, and we literally walk that riverbed and we start to look and look and look together. That means as a group, as people who care about homeownership in Indian country, we need to be walking our riverbeds better together. We need to be spreading out and understanding where to go and working together to kick some activity up into each other and, and provide for our people. So I want to encourage us in the context of our panel discussion today and our Q&A afterwards and our call to action to practice what we call sunrise thinking. Um, always remembering that every day is a chance at new opportunities, new solutions, new collaborations. Um, and literally this photo even means something. I don't know if you can see the animals in the bottom here, but this is the day that I took my fourth buck in my fourth year of hunting this last year. Um, right after this photo was taken. And um, 
I, I just, I want to encourage us all to practice that sunrise thinking and that concept that just because the way we've always done things or even just done things over the last, you know, 20 or so years to try to figure out homeownership in Indian country, doesn't mean that that's the way we always have to do things. And so I want to leave room for a brave space to explore new solutions. But before we do that, I want to enter into our panel discussion because I'm excited about the group of folks that we have here and the experience and the insight that they can provide for us too. Thanks, Tanya, for laying that groundwork. The history is so important. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, NeighborWorks Montana has been a part of this conversation for a number of years. Uh, the foundation of NeighborWorks Montana's mission focus is access to home ownership. Uh, our work is to create opportunities for home ownership to be equitably accessible to everyone. So the, the panel today will discuss both the systematic barriers that have been in the way for our native neighbors, uh, as well as possible opportunities we might have to overcome these barriers. Joining Tanya on this panel is Lakota Vogel, Executive Director at Four Bands Community Fund in South Dakota. Lakota is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. She has a degree of sociology from the University of Notre Dame. She has a master's degree from Washington University where she concentrated in economic security and social development through the life course of American Indians. Also joining the panel conversation is Bob Gochi, an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Bob served as executive director for the Salish Kootenai Housing Authority for 20 years. He has served as the chairman for the National Commission on American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Alaskan Housing, Seattle Board of the Federal Home Loan Bank, Fannie Mae's Housing Impact Council, Nahasda Rules Making Committee and the CDFI Advisory Board appointed by President Bush. He currently serves on the Salish and Kootenai Tribal Board, Salish and Kootenai Technologies, and the Board of Montana Housing. Welcome panel. I know we are acutely aware of time, so I'll dive right into questions. If you all have questions that pop up through this conversation, please um, either put them in the chat or, or just- Let's go potty, Leo. Thank you. Come on, buddy. <laughs> have to do my host duties of making sure everybody's muted too. Um, okay, my first question for each of you focus on, focuses on tribal um, economic impacts of home ownership. So we'll start with Tanya. Tanya, why is it so important to build strong home ownership programs? Thank you for the question. I think um, home ownership is a, it's an economic stabilizer, but it's also an economic stimulator. I think um, when we talk economic stabilization and, and even that, that even means cultural stim stabilization, um, it's the security of better health outcomes. It's the security of better education outcomes. It's the preservation of our culture and our languages. Um, but it also stimulates our economies too. When we have more of our tribal membership able to purchase a home, live at home, work at home within the boundaries of their own lands on our reservation and give into our local economy, we don't have so many dollars leaving the reservation now. Um, one thing that we shared with our tribal council was even if we were to put up 40 new homes and all of those homes bought a gallon of milk a week, that would be so much, I don't remember what the dollar amount was, but extra dollars that we would retain if they bought a gallon of milk a week from our three grocery stores in our different communities on our reservation. Um, you can probably double or triple that for some families. And again, that's just talking milk. And so um, it, I think it just stabilizes our families and it also stimulates our economy. Great, thank you. Um, Bob, this next one is for you again, focusing on tribal economic impacts. Um, what does supporting homeownership mean for other housing assistance? Well, right now, because we haven't really fully um, developed the home ownership opportunity for members of the Montana tribes, a lot of those folks that could otherwise qualify 
for home ownership are living in subsidized units. So if we had successful home ownership programs, it would free up an awful lot of subsidized units for low income families that don't have anywhere else to go. So, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing home ownership would do is the folks that pursue home ownership and eventually end up uh, owning their house, they have the opportunity to create equity, which we all know uh, in the rest of the world, equity is what sends your kids to college. Equity starts small businesses. Uh, it helps your retirement, uh, allows you to provide your own home repairs. So that opportunity hasn't fully been realized by tribes. Um, See, and Konya touched on this, we encourage young people on all of our reservations uh, to go to college, get an education. Most of our reservation in Montana have tribal colleges. We have Sailor's Duty College here. We have a nursing uh, degree program, an RN program. We also have education programs, uh, uh, human resources. A lot of those people to find well-paying jobs have to go off the reservation. It's even it's even worse on some of the other Montana reservations. We have more job opportunities here with, you know, six banks and two or three uh, hospitals. A lot lot more commerce. But if, if it's like Tanya said, if your best and brightest are leaving after they're educated or to get an education, don't come home. They're the ones that are that should be building the future. So we're losing. A, we're having a brain drain. Uh, and finally, uh, in Montana, we have a shortage of subsidized housing that is at least 2,000 units. And being able to find the capital to get those units built would provide a, a huge number of jobs. Uh, so we need more resources. The Nahaza Block Grant funds that, that fuel most of the subsidized units in Montana has been basically flatlined. This year, there's a bump. And in, in 2010, there was a little bump. Other than that, since Nahasa was passed 25 years ago, the funding hasn't dramatically increased. So each year as costs go up, more and more and more of it is being used to subsidize units. Meanwhile, we're not getting any 515 money. There isn't as much money nationally, but we meet, need to make the case that we've never caught up with 515 subsidy, which would work well in Indian country. That's that's been my one of my big targets for years. Nahaza doesn't allow us to participate in Section 8. Uh, and, and other subsidized programs are not yet available to tribes. Even if they, they could get the subsidy, they can't build the infrastructure. So, so, so home ownership would help all of these issues, uh, you know, freeing up units and getting more cash there. Thanks, Bob. Um, Lakota, what does home ownership do for a tribal economy, sp specifically focused on business growth? Hi, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I, there's not much I can probably say that the other two panelists said about that, but it's, you know, it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, honestly. Um, when an individual who wants to start a business in their community has, feels secure in their home and can live without thinking about um, maybe what their next um, living condition would be like. It helps them to fully, they're fully able to engage in the work, school and family life. And, um, you know, it, it increases people's health and well-being and mental health. So all of those things, when we think about people, including business owners, they are a whole person that need to have some of their basic needs met. And housing is one of those basic needs in order for them to be a creative participant participator in their economy. So we, we think it's really important if you're going to encourage um, small businesses to start in your community, um, your reservation community, it's really important to have housing stock available for those entrepreneurs to live in and then so they can be fully committed to their to their business as well. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for each of you that will maybe give us a little bit more background and context. Um, I'll start with you, Bob. Um, in your lifetime career experience, uh, how has housing been handled for Native Americans? And, and can you give us an idea of what a day in the life of a tribal housing authority is like? Oh, 
Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you. That, that That's really the question that, that hits the nail on the head. You know, I was lucky uh, that I, I worked, I was raised for, uh, uh, worked with our tribe uh, that had a lot of things we took for granted. For example, in 1940, our tribe started a revolving credit program uh, to provide capital to farmers and ranchers who couldn't get bank loans on trust land. That program grew to 40 million, $40 million that provides housing opportunities as well as operating loans for ag. And so that option was always there. So when I was hired as housing director in 1993, we only served the lowest income members of our tribe. And, and we had it worked like clockwork, like it was supposed to, like the real world. Not until I got talking to other reservations, I realized that a lot of the other reservations in Montana had no other resources to meet the housing needs for upper income families. They didn't have a credit program and couldn't get credit. So they were using the HUD program to house a lot of people that it wasn't really designed for. So, so the more we thought about it, we realized and, and it opened my eyes that what, what reservations need is access to capital. When I was lucky enough to serve uh, on the National Commission with, with a guy named Warren Lindquist, who, who was a former HUD assistant secretary, but he was also uh, understood the use of capital. He helped create the New York Housing Finance Authority and others. I mean, he was, he, and he was responsible for a lot of the work we saw in the HAZA. That and the, and the Federal Home Loan Bank showed that most bankers are interested in profit. And when you can't make a loan on reservation land uh, because you don't see it as profitable, if you have to wait for the BIA and you have to can't get a survey done, you can't get a, 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 an, a, an appraisal that meets muster, all those different things, it's not profitable for banks. That's why we need a lot of subsidy while we're transitioning. The third thing is <clears throat> tribal loans will all, always be non-conforming and housing authority directors don't understand the dynamics and only by uh, today, only by working with outside agencies like NeighborWorks, they were a godsend for Salish and Kootenai. Salish and Kootenai, you know, I left there almost 20 years ago. They provided over 2,500 uh, individuals with certificates for first time homebuyer education. And it shows in, in, you know, we have resources. Once they finish it, they can get a loan. Montana Board of Housing has been great about buying those loans. Uh, but, but they have been so uh, busy trying to keep families uh, in underfunded units. Because you have to remember something. In Indian country, they're so homogeneous. When you evict somebody following the HUD model, they don't really go anywhere. Almost always, they just move in with a family member because that's the culture. Tribe, they can't, most tribes in Montana don't say no to families. So, so it creates a, a unique set of problems. So by working with more culturally relevant processes, I think finally HUD and the tribes are waking up to supportive housing services. Right now, tribal leaders, I think are the key. And, and getting them to understand and support what the work of the housing authority and supportive housing, a lot of the political pressure they get can be dealt with. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more convinced than ever, ever that the capacity at the tribal level and getting tribal leaders on board, the way Nahasa was designed is imperative, but it isn't easy. Tribal uh, housing directors, keep in mind out of eight tribes, we have seven TDHEs and we have one program. That's Little Shell, they're a department of the tribe. Everybody else is a TDHE. If they push very hard on, on policies and working, oftentimes they, they, they run into conflicts politically. Uh, two years ago in our region, we have 32 tribes in our whole region, not just Montana, 16 directors were replaced. So that kind of turnover, you cannot sustain the rental program and the challenges of dealing with the demands of the grantees and the regulators and also the demands of the tribe. But we're learning. And I'm like Tonya, I am very optimistic and, and love her sunrise thinking and analogy. You know, I think it's never too soon. This is, I'm approaching 40 years of doing this. And you see a lot of ground replowed over and over as people come into it. 
And the solutions seem simple until you really dig deeper and they're not simple. It takes collaboration and trust and I'm really optimistic right now. So I was a little probably more than you wanted, but sorry. No, that's perfect. Thanks, Bob. Um, Tanya, a couple of related questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what is a CDFI and how could a CDFI help in the pursuit and provision of homeownership opportunities? And then um, give us maybe a little example of how that has worked on the Fort Belknap, in the Fort Belknap Indian community. Yes, thank you. And Bob, it's never too much. I love hearing you share because you have all of those years of experience and it might be maybe sort of sunset for you, but it's still sunrise for some of us. And so I'm really glad that we can still share the same days together. Um, so a CDFI is, it, it stands for a Community Development Financial Institution. Um, CDFI can be a bank or credit union. It can be a loan fund or a venture capital fund. Um, it can have a lot of different shapes and sizes to it. Um, the CDFI model that works really, really well in partnering with a housing authority to um, expand its offerings, to augment its programs, and to really get down to business to make things happen is a loan fund. Um, and so that's exactly what Montana Native Growth Fund is, is a native CDFI um, based in a reservation community. And our loan fund specifically targets um, homeownership opportunities. We do other things also. We also do some consumer lending that's designed to be capacity building lending to help buyers um, either co consolidate, you know, bad loans or things like that um, and get prepared to using credit wisely and to be able to handle a home mortgage. Um, the thing that's unique about CDFIs is they're all about community development and community development finance is very unique from banking finance. Um, it is not we don't go into this with the approach that we're going to turn a high revenue. Um, we don't go into this with an approach of, um, you know, hitting a high mark in loan originations. I'll never pay our programs officers on commission. Our goal is literally to grow the story of our people. It is to lift up our community and build our our capacity to sustain ourselves, to sustain our future generations. And so for every loan that's deployed, that's a provision of access to capital that otherwise wouldn't be there because the larger banks don't understand our communities, aren't working on the ground in our communities. <clears throat> every dollar deployed is paired with some sort of a development service. And sometimes that looks like a financial literacy class, a budgeting course, a savings course. Um, sometimes it's culturally empowered homeowner education. Um, and there is a difference. You know, there's homeowner education that hits the high points, covers the four C's, everything that an underwriter is going to look at, you know, and I know that world well. That's what I did before I came into this was mortgage banking finance. I ended as an, a DE certified underwriter, um, did a lot of USDA loans in 17 different states for 70 branch offices, underwrote loan after loan after loan. So I know how that system works, but bringing that to Indian country and trying to help our people fit this model that conforms to a model that didn't understand this, our people is not the solution. Um, and so we're able to work in this sort of brave space to design development services that make sense, that resound with our folks that we're working with, um, and ideally new programs that better fit the needs of our communities. So at Fort Belknap, that meant um, we did two things to build, um, to lay the groundwork for better opportunities. In all of 2019, we worked on passing the Hearth Act in our community. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that stands for helping expedite and advance responsible tribal homeownership. Um, it's an act that um, restores sovereignty to the tribes by removing the BIA from the initial review process and approval process and giving that back to the tribe. So now at Fort Belknap, we're able to review and approve our own home site leases, but we still have a partnership and a close connection with the BIA to carry that through through recording in a certified TSR, which is required by a secondary market. But we become um, active in this pivotal space of being a, a bridge and a connector between um, what sounds like gobbledygook for folks who've never experienced homeownership and the secondary market that just speaks that language, you know, without any hiccups. So 
it's a bit of a long answer. I'm sorry. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Like you said, it's never too much. Um, Lakota, can you tell us a little bit about your CDFI? How has this worked in Cheyenne River? Um, and can you give us some examples of your homeownership program? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Tanya summed up the passion and commitment that CDFIs have. And so Four Bands Community Fund has been around for 20 years. And I think it what started it all was we all look inwards to our community and notice that there's an access problem, right? And so what Four Bands saw first was an access um, for capital for entrepreneurs. We were noticing that only 1% of the businesses downtown were native owned. And so that's that was our starting point and what we wanted to address in um, offering you know, services to our community. And then we built our model around that. And recently in 2019, as we grew older, we kept continuously hearing about the access to capital and the gap there for our homeowners and our community members. And there was a lot of issues towards that. So we finally joined a coalition called the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition and worked together for five years on developing what it would look like if we could get access to longer term capital as a CDFI. So what's interesting is um, when you support entrepreneurs in your community and a reservation, you can get access to USDA dollars for 30 years to develop something through the intermediary lending program or the RMAP program, which is the rural micro, micro enterprise assistance program. So that's all 30 year money. And then you can relend that out to your community members, but we couldn't find 30 year money for housing. And so we just thought that was odd as newbies in the field and all of the, the old hats like Bob were saying, nope, that's normal. Um, it's just a problem out there. And basically we're able to get the USDA's 502 program to directly lend money to us as one of the two pilot sites in the nation to pilot this program in South Dakota. So we could see if we could get $502 out within our community, you know, relying on the relationships we had um, and get it out at a higher rate or faster rate than what USDA was able to do. And so we did that. So in a matter of nine months, we deployed over a million dollars um, to over nine homeowners in our community. And that actually matched what USDA was able to do in a decade. So <laughs> we were able to do that in nine months and very proud of that. And it's all based off of relationship and understanding what's going on in your communities. And uh, we're learning a lot in that space. We've done on Shine River over $3 million in homeownership, direct um, conventional mortgage lending here. And now we're sort of building out that, I, that thought about a secondary market if that's possible um, for the type of loans that we're doing, because Bob used a word that non-conforming loans, we will never have non-conform, or our loans will always be non-conforming. And it's it's true, but it's it's also this idea that maybe it's just not the right loan product. Like I, the mortgage industry just does not have the right more, you know, mortgage product on the market to serve our markets the way that they are right now. And that's what we're standing up saying as CDFIs, we know we can put our heads together with all the right people and come up with that product if we can get the right partners to fund us and we can continue to show impact, you know, at greater rates than any other mortgaging company that's out there. So that's us. That's the sunrise thinking. <laughs> what a what a perfect transition to a conversation about solutions, Lakota. Thank you. Yeah. Um so, so focusing a little bit more on solutions, Bob, um, what can housing authorities do to support a strong homeownership program? So, so I, I don't know who helped uh, put these questions together, but you hit one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Thank you. So it's not popular, but uh, it was touched on by Sonia in her, in her comments earlier that I listened to a Lakota elder at a, at a conference say that he believes, and he was a well-read elder, and he, it was mentioned earlier, the hierarchy of need, that we shouldn't approach it as go get a home ownership loan. We should tell the council, we're all interested in our children, our culture, and our language, because only after you are properly housed safely in an uncrowded, safe home, will you improve education outcomes, healthcare outcomes, and ultimately, once those are in place, 
then people have time to, you know, learn the language, learn the culture. Uh, more than now, it's a miracle in the, in our region that the language and culture has survived as well as it has. We have a vibrant culture here. Uh, you know, the language is threatened, but but the culture is alive. For us to make sure it survives, we need those people who are struggling and in crisis and living in crowded conditions. So my my one of my things right now is we need to have a bigger stick for a, a habit that they didn't create, that the HUD program created by not understanding the problem. And, and, and I'm not going to beat up HUD too bad because they were there when nobody else was. They built after uh, the 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy was able to change the definition of eligible 1937 housing applicants to tribes. But we got a program that we had to put in place that didn't really work in Indian country. That lasts today. And we have families, and you, I touched on this before, who are living in a subsidized unit who frankly, anywhere else in the world would not be subsidized. Even though you have some reservations, 50% unemployment of adults, you have 50% working. Those people should be celebrated for looking for other housing that is home ownership and drive the home ownership module. The way, the way housing authorities can do it by making tough decisions after consultation with tribal councils to set appropriate rents. If you live in a in a in a any subsidized unit, your rent goes up outside a reservation. Every year, your income goes up, your rent goes up. If your income comes down, your rent comes down. Indian country under Nahaza, tribes and housing authorities can establish their own rent. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure to keep rents low. It's called ceiling. And we have a lot of ceiling rents. What housing authorities and boards and tribes need to discuss heart to heart is a sustainable rent that's affordable to everybody. That's when families income goes up, 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 then they are they're logically looking then at home ownership rather than staying comfortable at a unit that has got a ceiling rent. And, and the law doesn't have a penalty as long as they were eligible when we moved in. So that's the biggest point. When I train today, which isn't as much as I used to, I'm trying to kind of spend more time with my grandkids, I tell them, have this tough conversation. Have the tough conversation because we do want people that do well to, to, to go out and set an example. Everybody doesn't drive the same car out on any reservation I've ever been to. They all shouldn't live in the same house. And once we start seeing houses that have amenities that are attractive and location, then people will get it. I, I'm sure in a matter of time, this is going to happen. But part of it has to be a little nudge to see your rent rise in a, in a subsidized unit. The second thing, capacity at the tribal level. Uh, I, would, I would tell each tribal housing authority what they need to do is number one, build capacity. And I'm talking about financial capacity, capacity to recognize resources, to spend the resources appropriately and to report on them enthusiastically. That creates more opportunity. Tribes that do that have a lot more access to a lot of resources. Oftentimes when I go out and train, they're trying to survive solely on the HASDA funds and they don't even look for other resources. You know, so, so that would be two message. And the third thing is don't reinvent the wheel. Get a hold of RCAC, get a hold of NeighborWorks, get a hold of Enterprise Foundation. Uh, we have a lot of really willing partners out there that have tremendous resources, including the federal home loan banks with, with their, uh, uh, you know, their affordable housing program. And, and oftentimes they have down payment assistance and a lot of exciting things that just aren't known about. And, and keep in mind, I'm not, I'm not saying this in any judgmental way. I, I'm saying it, housing directors today are under the fire so badly, particularly with COVID, that they oftentimes they're so short staffed and there's so much pressure uh, because they don't often get support from the tribal leadership on evictions, uh, different things that, that they need to do or alternatives, let's say to evictions. 
uh, that they're always under stress and they always are getting pressure from HUD, they're getting pressure from the membership, they're getting pressure from the tribal leadership. Uh, uh, being a housing director today in Indian country is, is a very, very challenging uh, proposition. Now you throw in all of the money that is coming down the line due to COVID and we should be celebrating, right? Unfortunately, a lot of the tribes in our region don't have the capacity to capture the funding in some of the timeframes that have been established. We're working diligently to make sure that we can, but uh, this is a fact. The capacity, construction capacity, the repair capacity, the capacity to kind of balance all these uh, things that are moving along uh, is still developing and tribes will get it. You know, once they master, uh, you know, once uh, tribes mastered the horse, things changed on the plains. You know, and, and uh, the same thing can happen today. Once tribes decided they wanted to master gaming, it didn't take too long before they were bigger than Nevada. So I know that if we can get tribal leaders to focus on how they can build their economies and their housing programs, they need to put their attention and help the housing authorities rather than calling it HUD program and not getting involved. And I see that all too often. Thanks, Bob. My pleasure. Tanya, what changes do our tribal members need to make in order to support homeownership? That's a good question. I have to add to Bob's at the end and partner with your local native CDFI. <laughs> and I just have to add that. Because oh, I usually do. <laughs> That's because, my new mantra. Truly because we are the bridge builders and, and, it, and it leads really well into that question about what tribal members can do. Um, I think the answer might say be, you know, conventionally take home our education, which is so important. But remember just a little bit ago when I was showing you the slides of my family and their experience. So two generations ago, the government still couldn't figure out what to do with us. And so they tried to assimilate us and then remove us and then tuck us back in little bits of land and then get rid of us again and then put us back in and now give us money to say, figure out how to be self-determined. So in the midst of that is the churches and the boarding schools and others coming in to say, here, we'll help, here's our solution. And all kinds of atrocities happened there. So you can understand that in the heart and the mind of a tribal member, there is a natural aversion to outside influence. There will always be that natural aversion to accepting what comes from the outside as this is how you're supposed to do things. And that's a barrier. It's a barrier in the hearts of our people and it's a barrier for banks and as good hearted and as amazing as NeighborWorks America and Enterprise Foundation and some of our local banks want to do that. Sometimes there still is an unfortunate gap there. And so that's why I say working with native CDFIs is so crucial because our boots are on the ground. We're right there in ceremony with our people. We're right there watching our children grow up. We're right there speaking languages. We're right there. And so um, what tribal members can do, I guess, um, is not just sign up for homeowner education class. I actually kind of go back to um, a little bit of a story. When we were passing our Hearth Act through, we went and hand delivered it in DC. And one of our attorneys who had helped write that act, and he served as assistant secretary at Department of Interior under the Obama administration said, I used to leave work and I would take off my shoes and walk through that lawn. And I would do it just to feel the earth on my feet, just to ground myself because the work was so heady and there was so much going on in my outside world that was a little bit contradictory to my personhood. And so I would just ground myself. And I thought that is such good advice. So to answer that question, often what tribal members can do to support home ownership is ground ourselves. The, the core tenants that make home ownership possible and successful and sustainable is a value system. It's a value system that actually perfectly aligns with who we are as a people. And that's how we teach home ownership. Instead of talking about the four C's, we actually talk about our traditional lodges as a teepee. We would put up a, a, a four poles at the beginning and often we would name those poles. And they would sometimes be a family member or a story or a month or something. But for the purposes of our education, we name them values. So that's provision, giving, integrity, strength. 
And then we carry folks through how those traditional values actually do build into the four C's, but that's a part of who we are and always have been. And so I think grounding ourselves to um, that, that drive to provide for ourselves and for each other. You know, back in our day, in the midst of our economies crashing, we still had to hunt, we still had to take care of our people, we still had to function as a group, and we cared. And so we still have to figure out how to work and serve and love. And so I would say grounding ourselves is big. And then we spend a lot of time with our folks with just visioning. You know, if you again, you think back to my dad was the middle of the termination era. And so visioning wasn't really a part of their story. It was more like survival. And so just barely, my generation is just barely in the middle of this self-determination era. And so starting to think about how we can actually uh, vision things uh, for ourselves is, is just crucial. Um, and then setting forth a plan. And then we sit down and work through a budget and a savings plan and talk about what that means in the numbers. But you have to start with that grounding piece. Awesome, thanks, Tanya. Um, Lakota, maybe an opportunity to expand a little bit on a, a conversation that you had in the chat. Um, what is it like right now to purchase a home in Indian country? Um, and what does the product process like and, and is it working? That's, that's true. I was just thinking a lot. Um, you know, we, we started out like the nice thing about CDFIs is that we get we get capital and then we sort of just we know we know it needs to go into home ownership and then we get to figure out sort of like backwards plan about what that looks like. So you sort of sounds bad, but you sort of make things up as you go. You know what the model looks like and then you try to make it you know fit that you know the what is it the round circle into the square hole or whatever it is. But basically it didn't it didn't work. And so the first thing we do is in realize the client has faced so many systemic barriers to their dream of home ownership that the first thing we do is just talk, ask them about their goal. Like once again, we've been doing this work for 20 years and we've tried to in, help clients envision their goals, their financial goals. And it would always be home ownership, but we were never helping in that space. And so like saving, putting money in savings accounts has never been a more you know, real goal until the moment we started offering home ownership loans. Like we could do them ourselves. And so when you give somebody the goal, the first thing you say is tell us about your journey and what you're hoping for. Then you've got to work through what community they want to live in. Um, is the land in their name and what's the status of their land? Is there already water and sewer on the home site? <laughs> What kind of house are they thinking about? Like a manufactured mo mobile home, maybe a um, governor's home. We have a program here that's called that. Are they thinking stick built, an existing structure? But most often it's gonna be new construction because we have no housing stock available, very, very little housing stock available for purchase. And so a lot of that is just talking through this whole journey of like what land type, house type, and then trying to match a mortgage product to that dream and working on the subsidy, the equity, the subsidy stacking you have to do for an individual to get to that, whatever that mortgage product is. And it's a lot of back and forth with the client. And sometimes people think that you start with building their credit score and you, and you build on their savings goal, but actually those things take less time than it takes to secure a piece of land on the reservation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we do is we just start right away with the land type and the type of home, and then it helps them move faster through the pipeline. But then we mention, let's check their credit score. And we don't have a minimum credit score required. We actually just say, just no delinquent accounts. And if there are delinquent accounts, uh, we talk through what that looks like. And if we can clear that up within the time frame of them wanting to close the loan. And then we, we make sure that they pay off small dollar loans so that they can afford the monthly payment that the mortgage is going to require. Um, so these are things that we taught, we encourage si sort of simultaneously them do, and then to enroll in a home buyer education class, just so they get the real reality of what it's going to take to own a home. And they can do that through our local housing authority. And then we just mentioned that they need to save at least $2,500. That's been about what the loan closing fees and um, appraisal fees have come out to be for each one of our loans. And it's not too high of a number that it doesn't overwhelm our families. And if they can save more than that, that's definitely great. But those are the, some of the steps that we ask our homeowners um, to go through. 
and it's it's worked well. Like I said, it, it doesn't work perfectly. It takes time, but each one of those you know components is like a rusty wheel, and we're slowly adding oil to these wheels, like the BIA, and getting the certified TSRs back because we actually mortgage trust land. That process is now fast enough to where we can get them back in within a two to three month time frame because we know the realty officer. They know the importance of it. We've spent years developing that relationship, and we can do that faster now because we've been slowly adding the oil and. I definitely think it's possible. Um, it's just understanding you need that advocate. And so it's like having um, a pain advocate. When you go to IHS and you start enrolling, it's really important. The doctor will look at the person in pain and say, well, they're just exaggerating. And you need that person next to you to say, no, Lakota doesn't normally act like this. This is you know, odd for her. And they need to interpret when then the doctor and you need that person in between. And that's what CDFIs or any other homeowner coach does. But that's what we need in Indian country in order to make these mortgage products work because the grandma that's working at Head Start and trying to just do her job and take care of her three grandchildren and then navigate this lending process and all of these things is just, it's an overwhelming task and she really needs that advocate next to her to do that. So that's kind of a brief look at what it looks like. Thanks, Bogle. I appreciate, or I appreciate that. Um, so I do have one, one more question for each of you. I know we are in the Q&A period um, and there's some questions in the chat. So if we could just take maybe 10 more minutes to ask and answer these last three questions, they might um, help answer some questions in the chat too. Um, so Bob, similar to the question I asked you just a little bit ago, but focusing more on tribes, what, what can tribes do to support strong, a strong homeownership program? So the tribes I've seen turn around programs uh, for home ownership, they're the ones that got more involved. Okay, tribal leadership needs to understand all the things we've been talking about as benefits, you know, economic development, you know, community, now houses, Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act. It allows for a lot of activities beyond just what HUD activities are. You know, you can uh, build community centers, you can do infrastructure, you can have youth sports activities, you can have cultural classes, any of those things that, that you choose to, and tribes need to understand that. So they have to have context when they appoint board members. So, so, so their first job, the biggest thing a tribal leader can do is support tribal home ownership through well-written codes. And I'm talking eviction foreclosure, what authority you give to the TDHE, how you recognize the CDFI, that's all in the code. And they need work with that. And they need to have community meetings. They need to explain to the membership, a lot of which are fearful of home ownership because of the instability of the economy and whatnot. But I think, you know, ultimately uh, you get to the membership, you have them talk about it, listen to them because that's what we're doing this for. You know, it's not like the old program where we build five houses and say, okay, here's what you get. Here's what the rules are, sign here and move in. It's a lot more complex than that now. And, and uh, we need to be better uh, listeners. We need to consider the trauma a lot of the families have been through and make sure the programs represent their needs and listen to how we address those. Uh, I think tribal leadership, they, don't ha they have housing TDHEs and housing programs, so they don't have to become experts, but they do need to know enough about what resources are available that they support their housing professionals in their daily work. Uh, and again, bringing the membership along. So if they're proposing a new rule through tribal court, let's have a common discussion of why this is there. This isn't to hurt anybody, but it's to help people. And it can, it can tribal courts uh, by their nature can have a cultural bent. So they need to have that discussion and allow for, for those things uh, early on in the development of their code. They need to support tribal courts. And, and again, it's, it, it doesn't mean you have to have a rigid court. It means you have a court that understands what the alternatives are and how they can best mitigate issues. Because housing programs today are a revenue and expense business. They have to have enough revenue through grants, through rent, through other programs so they can sustain themselves and grow. Over the last about 10 years, we have not, as, as a group in, in Montana, made progress on our waiting list. As a matter of fact, we've lost ground. We have younger and younger families. So uh, 
you know, I, I, my message would be to tribal leaders or people that want to work is make sure they do have a clear understanding of what the laws are today. I encourage they review their, their ordinance or excuse me, their code so that they make sure the directions they're giving their board are consistent with what the goals of the tribe are. They don't have to adopt, just use what was there, but it's an opportunity for them to work with the membership and recognize the reality of what's going on and give some incentive to people that are willing to go out and stick their neck out uh, and follow the path to home ownership, which can be very cumbersome. And I would just add one point because, you know, I, I know we're getting short on time. And I talked to Sonia about this and, and I, I, I would like to just put this out there. I really think that there needs to be a tribal working group and, and it can be regionally or it can be based with, you know, my, uh, uh, my, the Montana affordable housing, however, uh, to convene and review all federal housing programs and to better identify those little imperfections that are huge roadblocks to tribes. Most federal legislation say eligible applicants are this, 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 and then the last sentence says, and Indian tribes. Even though there will be maybe inherent in the program a barrier uh, that is hard to overcome. A good example is water sewer money, where you go out and assess the economics of a community and whatever they can afford, they pay in a monthly payment to support the water system and any loan. So that's how the, usually water sewer was determined when there's money, you get a grant and loan. Well, in Indian country, if it's trust land, you can't take a lien on that property for the loan. So you have to have an alternative to that. That's an unintended consequence of the, of the process of providing water sewer and other infrastructure through USDA, for example. The same thing exists, and I see there's a couple of questions on the 502 program and other federal programs. This working group would work in concert with the federal government uh, to offer uh, solutions that the tribes would be able to come up with and protect their sovereignty. Because all USDA funds are, are, are based on population. Montana has about 7% of, uh, of the population of Montana and no way are we getting 7% of the USDA money and have it for years. So I, I really think we just need some tweak. The people at USDA are wonderful to work with. They're very good at Washington all the way down but it's, it's really not their issue. They have to follow the regulations. I'm suggesting a working group work with Congress and the agencies to make, suggest these tweaks. And it wouldn't hurt the programs. The money's already authorized and appropriated, but everybody wants the tribes to get their fair share and right now they're not. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. That's it. Um, Lakota, in your opinion, what systems change needs to take place to support strong home ownership program? Well, I mean, I think I'll just be brief on this, but I, I've, you know, it's not been more clear to me about the systemic barriers that um, natives place with trust land than it has been in the past two years. And to me, it was easy for me to take a step back. And I seen this um, model given by the Racial Equity Institute about the way that we are all trained to um, and educated, we're all trained and edu educated to fix broken people, right? But we're not trained and educated to fix broken systems. Even the schooling that I went to as a, a social worker, it was about becoming a clinical social worker and fixing systems, you know, giving them more financial education and things like that. And so taking a step back in the past like year and a half has been about what systems are broken because the bottom line is no matter what amount of homeownership education or financial education we put into somebody, it's not going to undo the systemic equity or inequity and exclusion. Uh, we need to forge products together. Um, we need to forge practices and policies together that advance an equitable economy. And we can't ask the individual to overcome the structural. And I've, oftentimes we're asking that grandma who works at a daycare to overcome the structural barriers that exist. And it's mainly the trust land status. And so it's nobody on this call's fault that trust land exists, right? But it's something that has happened to us and it's synonymous with being Native American. So if you're a financial institution and you say you can't lend on trust land, you're saying you cannot lend to Native Americans. And what, what that means, it's just, we have to figure out how to make that work. And I think we've got the right people at the table to do that. And the, another, sorry for all the analogies, but another one is about, 
if you see a photo and if I showed a photo up here of a fish and he was belly up in a, a, and you saw him and you would think I would ask what, what happened to that fish? And you would say, well, there's something wrong with it. Maybe it ate something wrong. And that's how we viewed homeownership clients or CDFI clients. Something is going on with this client that they're not able to access capital. Something is wrong with this fish. Then scan back a little bit and you see a, a lake full of belly up dead fish, right? That's what's happening on Shine River Reservation today. We've got all of these belly up fish or just no homeowners and no option. And we need to say, what's wrong with that lake? There is something wrong with that lake. There is something wrong with the homeownership system because 30 plus years of poverty is not by accident and it is not the people's fault. So what systems can we work on to make this a better system for everybody? And in, that's including everybody on the call, all the federal supporters, all the financial institutions, the CDFIs, the advocates, all of us need to come up with a better system that serves our communities. And so that's my big, big sell everybody, but that's my systems change speech. I love that analogy. You just get such a good picture in your head, Lakota. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Tanya, last question goes to you. Um, who who needs to be involved and and where can we begin? I was still on mute. Um, I I just have to say I love that analogy too. It's just it's so perfectly represents exactly what's happening. Um, often as an underwriter, what, what I found is you'd bring families in that want to buy a home and so you really quickly look at what you have available and you get to know the family that the people and then the property that they want to buy the people in the property and you underwrite those first and then you match them to a product and most of the time there was a number of different products that would fit those that those people and the property that they have and they could go a number of different ways and it was my job to figure out what was the best way for them to go for their long-term success um, coming into Indian country and trying to accomplish the same thing is, it, 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 I can't say it's an impossibility, but it's very, very difficult because um, even if we build our people up exactly where they need to be, right? Um, the property is inherently, it's on trust land most of the time. And that's of, of no fault of our, our own. And so we've got issues there, which means we have very, very few products available because it's not, uh, it, it's not, uh, <laughs> profitable for banks to, to work in that in that field. So then we, we have to look at creating new products that fit the property and the people that we're working with. And so I love Bob's um, suggestion of having a working group that can really look at these. Lakota's encouragement to that all of us have a play in this, it really scrubbing the systems that are currently available, the very few products that are currently be available and figuring out why are they not working? Why are we still not getting loans out in Indian country? Why do we still have, why is this water still murky? Why do we have belly up fish? What is the problem? And so it leads so well into our call to action because our call to action within this call is to really explore what will it take to convene a native homeownership coalition throughout the state of Montana of federal, state, tribal, private stakeholders that can be part of that working group or support the work of that working group. Um, and so what we've been doing over the last little bit of time is um, talking to um, Fannie Mae about how they can sell, uh, support a coalition of this neighbor, nature and a working group of this nature. Um, and um, to start that work, I think we developed a, a survey that we would like to put in the chat um, to allow everyone here who's a part of this call, we'd like to encourage everyone who's a part of this call to take that survey, um, help us understand a little bit more where you're coming from um, and what, how, what level of interest you would have in um, being involved in this work over the long term. And there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Uh, but I think now is the time of any time for all of us to band together to bring equity in this space. So I'm gonna go off of this sharing my screen so that I can get that link and I'm gonna put that link in the chat. Um, and as we kind of shift into Q&A, we've got about 11 minutes left in this session. I kind of wanna open it up to some Q&A and, and allow folks to come off mute and have some, some healthy discussion with this last 11 minutes. But those of you that know, don't necessarily wanna talk, would you please go ahead and get started on that survey? That'd be great. I, I went, not, went ahead and put that link in the chat, Tanya. Oh, thank you so much, perfect. Yeah.
So if anybody has questions, go ahead and share your share your camera. Come off mute. You can ask the panel. There was one question early on, Bob, that I had as well. Can you talk, what is 550? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that, Hannah. 515 money, you talked early on about that. What is, what is that? What kind of money? 515. 515 USDA is yeah. a subsidized uh, rental program. Uh, where, where USDA uh, provides uh, assistance with building facility and then subsidizes the families. It's a very popular program. Somebody mentioned it in the uh, opening session this morning. It's in jeopardy and it's been underfunded for quite a few years. We're hoping a lot more funding comes back, but it'd be nice to have a carve out for tribes because it's a program they could really use. Just like the HUD 210 program for elders. We got to expose tribes to more of those resources. You know, if there if there isn't a lot of questions, I think what everybody in this call could do also is just advocate for the 502 direct lending. You know, USDA has been in this space to make sure that um, they piloted it. It's just not a long-term pilot. And so what we were ch charged to do is create uh, success with that program and saying we can do it as CDFIs. And so if anybody has any sort of dreams of just <laughs> helping us advocate for that, that needs to be continuously funded. And it's on sort of in the legislative circle right now of making sure other native CDFIs can get access to that long-term capital. And the beauty of that product is you only have to, um, if you get it directly as a CDFI, I don't have to do all of the rules that 502 requires, which is sometimes hefty. I just have to make sure that the customer maintains its eligibility like 502 normally does. And I have to make sure the property is eligible under USDA regulation. Then after that, I get to do everything I need to do to make the loan work for what works for my program. And then I pay back USDA this, you know, 1% on the money that I borrow from them. So it's a great program. It's the only long-term money on the market right now. And all CDFIs need access to that for native communities. So there's a waiting list for 515 money. Hi guys, it's Katina. And there's a long waiting list for new 515 money. And it's just not anything like Bob said, that's being, that's being, um, legislation isn't isn't giving us new money for it so what you're having is just make more um, acquisition rehab if um, you can get a developer interested that wants to buy one of the 515 projects rather than just letting it go to market well in montana board of housings probably half of our applications are for 515 rehab programs yeah this 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 uh, go around there's quite a few of them So that would be a good thing for the coalition that you're advocating for, right, Tanya, for you guys to come together and try to make some changes there on the 515 and see what you can mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. So one once you lose that from your state, you can't get it back. Once those, yeah. once that subsidy is gone, it's, it's, it's gone. It's reassigned. Yeah, we need a lot more uh, help with that. One mm -hmm. of the things we have touched on uh, today very much is uh, the model uh, of a tribal member as property owner, renter, investor. You know, part of the solution out there is to get individual tribal members access to capital to build units, four plexes, six plexes, maybe even small home ownership subdivisions. Uh, and and to, to, so all the weight isn't just on the tribe or the CDFI. You know, the way it happens in the rest of the world, there's quite a, a few private people that do this, and then you can put Section 8 vouchers and uh, do some other things. You know, most reservations shun that, but I, for one, think there is a place for that tribal member that wants to use a 184 loan to buy a fourplex uh, on trust land and rent three units and live in one, and they could, at today's rate, almost live for nothing. But HUD rule under 184, uh, prohibits that if it's a new uh, product because you have to have a rental history before they will consider rental income to help pay for it. Just crazy little rules like that. Mm -hmm. 
I just want to add to the discussion that sometimes, um, you know, we're in this position with limited products because of the trust land status and it becomes sort of the elephant in the room. Um, but I want to save some, save some spa brave space for how we approach that issue. Um, I think having the Hearth Act as an option is, is notable. Um, and I think more and more tribes are beginning to adopt that and restore their sovereignty and build their own capacity to govern themselves and to manage their own, you know, lease approvals and, and maintenance processes. Um, Salish Kootenai really, you know, led the way by becoming a title plant first. Um, and then Fort Belknap is shortly following by establishing the Hearth Act. Part of that conversation means the Department of Interior has had to review their internal processes and how they begin to work with tribes as they become more and more and more self-determined, self-sufficient, and self-governing. Um, and so, you know, earlier this year, um, the Department of Interior released um, a, they, we had a tribal consultation and they asked for open comment, comment period um, for folks to talk about what changes need to be taking place at LTRO um, to support a secondary housing market um, to better streamline the process. And there's a lot of work to be done in that space. Um, they should be releasing additional regulations that come out. Um, I think they'll be out by July or August, allowing the BIA to record hearth approved leases. Um, and so that progress is, is slow, but it's steady. Um, and I think somebody said it earlier, there's the right people in the room right now to make significant progress over the next few years. So I just, it's, it's notable to say that because I think it becomes such a scary thing. It's, it's, it's almost just like, a, like I said, an elephant in the room or a beast to deal with, but we can fix it. It's true. It's very true. And then there's also this people forget about like um, the peripheral sort of entities that support land transactions. So that you've got title companies, you've got appraisals, you've got inspectors, right? HUD inspectors, all of those types of entity groups need to be worked on and molded so they understand how to put trust land into this you know, a usable tool in the financial world. And so that's also another level of the work that you have to do because truthfully title companies can be one of the biggest barriers in order to solidifying a title transaction for any lender. So that's a, that's a big group that we all have to work on as well and keep those in mind when we talk about the barriers that um, the structural barriers that homeowners have to go through to just make this piece of land able to be financed. Very true. I also want, since we're just kind of, you know, pepper in here, but I really do want to bring up the concept of risk and risk mitigation. I think it's too easy for lenders and, and everyone with a stake in this space to automatically attribute high risk to loans in Indian country. And it's an unfair attribution. Um, when we met with HUD ONAP, we asked that question, what is the default rate on your HUD 184 loans over the last five years? And they could not give us an answer to that. They don't have the data. It's not being tracked well. And yet decisions are being made about that product on the basis that, that we're high risk, but that high risk is not necessarily qualified. And so it's, 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 it creates truly an unfair housing situation to Native Americans and to Indian country uh, by not qualifying that risk level well at all. I would say actually, as um, our tribal nations become more and more independent, specifically at Fort Belknap, we have a tribal enterprise that's growing and growing and growing. So our um, unemployment rate has decreased and our median income has increased significantly. The last five loans that our CDFI deployed in consumer lending capacity building products, those five loans, those borrowers had a, a disposable income after their housing, after their car credit, everything was paid for of $1,448. That's just leftover money that's not going to housing. So you cannot tell me that Indian country cannot support home ownership. We are growing and growing in, in, in our ability to take care of ourselves. Um, and these are not high risk. These are, I'm talking folks that have a median credit score of you know 650 to 750. And so the market is there. It's just creating the housing stock and then providing the products to meet that that need in Indian country. So I just I have to touch on that also. The other thing I'm excited about, and we've talked about this a little bit, uh, with if if Tonya is successful in Montana. Uh, 
and I, I have no doubt that she will be getting the CDFIs really engaged in partnership with the housing programs. There's resources they can help with, but if the, if the loan portfolios and loan originations grow and they reach the point where they are examined, and I don't know exactly what that would look like or what the alternative would be on legislation, Montana Board of Housing would love to buy those. You know, they, they buy 184s now, but they would love to buy 502 guaranteed as well. But one of the one of the catches, so that's one of those things that this working group could test, is what would be the uh, equally safe alternative for a CDFI that has training and a, a track record underwriting mortgages to be able to sell those mortgages to the Montana Board of Housing. In Montana, you know, I'm just talking about Montana. Now, being on that board, I, I know that there's, uh, you know, we, we, we look like we're going to do a lot of 184 loans, and then the stream has just kind of dried up for the last couple of years. I don't even know if we bought one for two or three years. Well, we are one minute over time. Um, I encourage you as I wrap up here to, to click on that Survey Monkey link in the chat take that survey. Um, I would love to just warmly thank our panel for this discussion today. And I, I thank all of you for listening and participating. Um, this does include our day today. Um, let's see, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for the optional coffee talk at 8 a.m. Um, followed by our plenary session at 9 a.m. So. Thanks again for joining. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Tanya, Lakota, and Bob. Thank you, Hannah. Thank Good you. job. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.